The threat of the Xenos upon humanity throughout the vast galactic empire of the Imperium is as vast as is its reach. From the fringe of the galaxy to Terra itself there are risks that left unchecked could bring the doom of all and leave humanity as a forgotten broken species left scattered in a few tiny irrelevant pockets, left precarious and for the few who survive perhaps speaking to a mythical legend known as the Imperium. Few believing it was ever real and that these stories of a golden empire are simple myths and likely fictions created by their ancestors. If humanity does not want to resign itself to such a fate, left as a forgotten species who are only remembered by the detritus littering the galaxy and its only survivors cowering on backwater worlds, biding their time until they are ignorantly and inevitably consumed by one of the many other nightmarish threats in the galaxy, then it must resist at every step every infraction and with the most brutal counter-assaults possible, crush the Xenos, especially those known as the Tyranids, for they are the most voracious, the most unrelenting. Their ability to continually evolve and genetically adapt to their enemy has made them one of the most terrifying threats to the Imperium, not to mention their quite literal nightmarish form and function. In the words of the Adeptus Mechanicus genitors, these xenobiologists, simply put, over the coming centuries we may be out-evolved to the point of extinction. Humanity of course wields its own armies of both immense scale and power, and while these forces are always the Imperium's primary approach in tackling any threat, there are many who within the scholarly walls of Imperial Bastions, Inquisitional Cadres and Xenobiologist Advisory Councils who would make it powerfully clear that this in itself may well not be enough. That some threats facing the Imperium will struggle to be defeated by the prevailing human power of sheer will alone. In both the Orc and the Tyranid Menace, we have seen how these threats are not merely speculative in the level of risk that they pose, we have seen it demonstrated clearly that they have the potential to bring both humanity and the Imperium to a point of extinction. So it must be followed that to truly crush the most deadly threats, one must know thine enemy. And to that end, our fate lies largely with the Mechanicus and their genitors, the Xenobiologists. Now I had originally planned this to be one single video, and as usual this quickly became very clear to me that this was not going to be practical. So this will now be a multi-part series studying Tyranid bioforms in general and in detail. First we'll do several overviews followed by more detailed singular focuses. We'll be looking at their biological processes, the threat they pose on a planetary and individual scale, what weapons do they employ and how critical a role are they for the Tyranid menace. Some creatures can be summarised in a paragraph or less, others have extremely detailed backgrounds and as always I think best to start with an overview and then we can delve more deeply into individual forms further in the future. As some, like the Gene Stealer, can be quite complex and I know I could very easily talk for over an hour on Gene Stealers alone. But today we begin part one with the general overview of Tyranid biology. Firstly though we come to the biologists, that is the xenobiologists of the Mechanicus and they are an unusual subsection within this faction. Ordinarily tech priests tend to view biological forms as weak and that the flesh will fail whereas the machine form persists. It's important to remember the Mechanicus view in this respect is both a worship of technology but that this is also largely guided by their wider ideological views that the most important thing in the galaxy is the preservation of knowledge and information above all. So it then follows that organic forms are especially bad for this due to their fragile nature. Once a human dies, any knowledge they held in their brain is lost. From the Mechanicus point of view, if a machine form fails, you may at least be able to recover and extract some elements of that information, or better still, if they're near death they can likely be more easily stabilised and then later have whatever useful information remains extracted for storage before their physical remains are sent for reprocessing. Much of this view of course originates as a result of the devastation that was the end of humanity's golden age, otherwise known as the Dark Age of Technology. The events at the end of this period would shake humanity to its core and bring it to a point believed to be at a real risk of complete annihilation, only then to be followed by the Age of Strife. But it was the Mechanicum and then who would later become the Mechanicus 
who rose from the ashes of humanity and quickly came to realise that the most important thing for all of humanity was the secure retention of its knowledge, for this was where its true power lay. Without its vast knowledge, it truly was nothing. However, this fairly pure and logical outlook was also steadily twisted by their quasi-religious underpinning in the form of the Cult Mechanicus, which subsequently believes that all knowledge already exists in the galaxy and is merely awaiting discovery. This is why for the Mechanicus and also the Imperium, it's considered generally tech heresy, equivalent of normal heresy within the Mechanicus, to experiment or invent with technology. Of course this is quite the grey area and you have individuals like Belisarius Call who are pushing the boundaries of this. Also, while the Emperor still walked among the stars, the outlook was looking very different and there was the real possibility for humanity to develop ever newer tech and genetic developments, but this has now slowly been obfuscated by millennia of indoctrination and dogma. One of the original roles of the biologists was in the studying of gene seed. As Amara Astarte had once noted that the new warriors of the Imperium were heavily flawed and that without their Primarchs they would continue to endure genetic problems. This was only worsened by the Emperor's insatiable desire to push things forward faster and ever more aggressively no matter the cost. It's like making a copy of a copy of a copy. Each time a tiny piece will be lost and eventually you end up with a very poor interpretation of the original form. So. When the second founding came around, the biologists were tasked with identifying and then developing a means by which to purge these genetic weaknesses. Furthermore, to prevent cross-contamination, the genetic material of each of the old legions was isolated, so that any new space marine chapters would receive gene seed only from their own genetic stock. Traitor legions' genetic material before their fall to chaos was also placed under a time-locked stasis seal by taking direct control of the genetic stocks. The biologists and the Adeptus Terra could, via their control of the baseline pure genetic material of the Astartes, have a level of control over the space marines in the aftermath of the heresy, for they could in theory at this point destroy or create new chapters of marines at will. While it may seem unlikely or even impossible that such a situation could occur, there was already precedent for this when Amara Astarte tried and failed to destroy all genetic stock of marines when she turned against the Emperor. Of course, unbeknownst to her, all of this material had already been replicated and stored elsewhere, and so despite the vision and assistance Astarte contributed to the Emperor's project, she was by the end of it all an unfortunately sad individual who had misplaced understandings about the Emperor's grand vision and was essentially a traitor. So while more standard biologists or genitors find their time occupied in the genetic cultivation and monitoring of all Imperial forces, primarily that of the Astartes, there are other branches of the biologists, namely the Xenobiologists, who also study specifically alien life in the galaxy. Within the Mechanicus, the biologists hold a different view to most tech priests because they see organic forms as machines but just formed differently, and as such they could be as or even more powerful than their metallic counterparts. Its outlook brings those more vocal biologists into direct conflict with both Mechanicus itself and also the doctrine of the Imperial Creed, that is the Imperial Cult, religious worship of the Emperor. More specifically, the sense that humanity is the true superior form in the galaxy. The suggestion from the biologists that there are forms of life that exist in the galaxy which could be biologically superior to humanity crosses into dangerously heretical territory. To us, this is obviously absurd, but try arguing that with a member of the Ecclesiarchy. Chances are you'll be burned alive before you had a chance to finish your explanation. Regardless though, genitors are quite widely present within the Imperium as they provide obvious uses in their exploration of Xenos species. They're commonly recruited by rogue traders, Mechanicus Arc exploratory fleets, Inquisitors, basically any exploratory force within the Imperium. And they're tolerated mainly because their research mostly provides information that can be used to improve humanity's ability to slaughter its enemies rather than just the pure research of aliens for the sake of knowledge itself. And genitors are known to have three primary outlooks that they lean toward, although, as always, many lesser and undocumented philosophical views undoubtedly exist among the vast members of the Biologist Mechanicus subfaction. 
Firstly, the Primus Humanum. This essentially says that while the biologists will research and explore all biological forms of life, there is an established and innate understanding in the divine purity of the human form as being a vessel for knowledge. Moreover, that the Emperor or Omnissiah's form exists as having been that of the ideal sentient being in the universe. This though is a fairly old outlook at this point in time, which should seem obvious given that it is a fairly standardized perspective for Imperials. Then you have the Apexists, a far more dominant philosophy, and they believe via their observations that adversity breeds strength in the organic, and that the truly perfect organism is one that continues to strive to overcome all and any challenges it faces by means of its own genetic evolution. This might seem specifically pertinent to what we're discussing today because the Tyranid form is truly the purest example of what Apexists espouse. Then we have the Vogelists, and Vogels are the followers of one Heydrich Vogel, who preaches a creed of forced genetic and biological augmentation in order to strengthen humanity for the perceived troubles ahead. Vogel's ideology suddenly crosses into a grey area of potential heresy because of this outlook and its apparent suggestion that baseline humanity is somehow biologically insufficient to defend itself and it requires tampering with in order to survive. And while this can be seen to some as heresy, it is also of course comically hypocritical of the Imperium which has spent millennia forging genetically adapted superhuman warriors as its only means of defending itself from total annihilation. One of the more interesting things though about genitors is that unlike their more mechanically inclined colleagues, they will usually have beneath their crimson robes augmented themselves with enhanced vat muscles, toughened skin able to resist varying degrees of heat and physical laceration, and then reinforced bones. Now, obviously this is highly comparable to those species that the genitors study, and who ever upwardly modify and improve themselves biologically, like for example, the Xenos species known to humanity as the Tyranids. The Xenobiologists finally will work most closely with the section of the Imperial Inquisition known as the Ordo Xenos, for they are the Inquisitors tasked with purging all alien life from humanity, and really in that sense the galaxy itself. While sometimes this can mean surgical strikes to purge growing nests of aliens from human worlds, the more extreme end can lead to humanity's most devastating sentence upon a world in the form of exterminatus. While not always those at the forefront of the Mechanicus, the genitors and xenobiologists are extremely important and in fact wield far more power than is perhaps immediately apparent. For they hold the keys to both the genetic knowledge of humanity's most powerful warriors and can be the trigger for the systematic annihilation of entire worlds, indeed entire systems. The specific origin of the Tyranids themselves is unclear. Although there is no shortage of wild speculation, all of which should be viewed with extreme levels of scepticism. A common confusion is that it was the Emperor's psychic lighthouse, known as the Astronomicon, which attracted the Tyranids to our galaxy. This is not specifically correct. In some respect, it should be patently obvious considering it is so well established that the Emperor's lighthouse barely emits enough psychic power to reach the periphery of our own galaxy, certainly not beyond it. So how would the Tyranids then have charted a course to our galaxy? It was in fact a device known as the Pharos, belonging to the Necron, which would make the Tyranids aware of our presence here in the galaxy. However, it was not merely this device alone that caused this. During the Heresy, the Astartes overloaded this device in an attempt to destroy it, and it was through this action that the Tyranids were alerted to our galaxy as being worthy of their attention, although it wouldn't be until much later when the most significant Tyranid incursions would happen toward the period of M41. Tyranids though have been discovered as having entered our galaxy by as early as M34, only three millennia after this time. The Tyranids themselves are regarded by many as the ultimate life form, a relentless form created by the purest need to endure and survive. As the Tyranid are a space-born species existing singularly as massive fleets, or that is, to the extent of our knowledge they are, they consume everything, while minimising waste and function 
by a process of biomass consumption. They take all they can from the worlds that they scour and minimize their net loss. They are voracious consumers of all organic life and will use all materials from a world including its mineral deposits and their oceans which they somehow convert into usable resources. Tyranids are so aggressive in these processes of consumption that unprotected worlds can be stripped to the bare rock in a matter of weeks, leaving behind nothing but a dusty, dead world bereft of little to any sign it were ever inhabited. The Tyranids themselves pull at some of humanity's greatest fears. Not only are they nightmarish of appearance, but they will consume and destroy us in the most horrific ways possible, burrowing worms, acidic sprays, jaws packed with masses of razor sharp teeth, and a clamping jaw that can crush metal as if it were nothing. But perhaps the most terrifying aspect of the Tyranids is their complete lack of reasoning. Nearly all races in the galaxy have some level of reasoning, even the dark forces of the warp and the blood crazed orcs, but not so the Tyranids. Like near enough all apex predators, the Tyranids do not have really any awareness of the suffering they inflict, nor do they hold any concepts about mercy. They are simply the perfect organism, whose brutality is only matched by their refined skills in vastly accelerated evolutionary development. All Tyranid forms are born to serve the single entity that is their hive ship, and this ship itself exists only as part of the entity that is the hive fleet. This will be their singular focus for their lifetime, from when they are birthed by the organ sacks of their ship's reproductive chambers to the moment they are dragged into the pools of acidic biomatter which will reduce them down to their constituent elements and be reabsorbed as new material to form yet more new Tyranid life forms. The Tyranids have no form of artificial constructed mechanical technology. They use their biotechnology to create organic iterations of what we might use. These will often also be sentient life forms to a degree, and the life cycles of Tyranid organisms are also usually highly symbiotic. They all rely on one another to function as a singular large entity. At a small scale, they will often fuse into each other's flesh so that it often is impossible to say where one Tyranid creature really ends and another begins. In this way, Tyranid warrior beasts wield living weapons that are literally extensions of their own bodies, each one a killing machine perfectly adapted to slaughter its victims. The Tyranid's genetic manipulation is so advanced in fact that they can actively develop new versions of their standardized organisms during an assault upon a world, or using specialized infiltrators they can gather genetic intelligence ahead of time. The purpose of this is to enable them to grow units that will suit a specific battle's needs with urgency, and as a result a high fleet can effectively create a force theoretically capable of overwhelming any opposition and breaking down the defences for any foe. For the defenders of a planet, this can be particularly troubling. Usually, when facing an enemy, humans have some standard expectation that after each engagement an enemy may be worn down, at least somewhat, as much as themselves, or have taken losses so that any subsequent assaults are a little easier to bear. This is nearly the opposite situation for those who are facing the Tyranids. Each wave of enemy assault will be more aggressive with a greater understanding of their strengths and enemy weaknesses. They may even face new, unseen bioforms each time, specifically born to deal with a problem that must be overcome. Were a Tyranid army to find a city with especially severe perimeter walls for example, their following assaults could contain a life form that burrows deep underground and destroys these walls below, causing it to fall and the city to be instantly overrun. A planet with a powerful air defense could find itself facing heavily shielded flying organisms that literally batter them out of the sky or tear them to pieces. A world with heavy surface to orbit ordnance may find itself literally clogged to a point of non-functioning by millions of small creatures which clog every piston hinge and will burrow themselves into its very circuitry to shred it from the inside out. Simply put, there are few worlds who have survived a Tyranid assault without paying an exorbitant price, usually in human lives, but often equally in planetary wealth and resources. Humanity fears the Tyranid perhaps more than any other species. Where Chaos are the corruptors, they have often more complex aims to achieve. The Tyranids have no goals other than complete and total consumption of every living cell on a planet, for they are truly the destroyer of worlds. To defend against the nightmare of the Tyranids, is simply a pure matter of survival, kill or be consumed. 
for the Tyranids have but three core objectives. Feed, grow and survive. Now the first and debatably most important of the Tyranid forms we will look at is that of the so-called Norn Queens. They live only upon massive hive ships in huge chambers at the centre of the hive fleet where they will ingest vast quantities of genetic materials. The hive queen will then produce asexually all the lesser bioforms. Now, unlike nearly all other Tyranid forms, the Norn queens are believed to be at least relatively sentient. This is how they're able to effectively control, to a degree, the fleet and send orders to Tyranid creatures on an invaded planet via their so-called synaptic web or the hive mind. They will then exist what are designated as synapse creatures who will retransmit a queen's order to lesser Tyranid forms. Norn queens require a constant supply of genetic material and raw nutrient biomass to clone or genetically craft new Tyranids. This biomass mainly consists of a raw liquid mix formed in reclamation pools on a target's planet's surface that are pumped up into the orbiting Tyranid hive ships through vast capillary towers. Genetic material can also be directly supplied to the queen. These raw materials will then be synthesized into new bioforms by the queen's genetic shredder organs, which will disassemble DNA structures from a gene bank of millions of different genotypes that can create new organisms using the biomolecular machinery of the Norn Queen. These Norn Queens over time have developed forms through continual assessment of their efficiency and survival so that specific dominant forms have developed. Once a more perfected form has been established as not requiring any current further development, more bioforms of the same will be cloned by all the other Norn Queens of a given fleet. Usually Tyranid bioforms are not cloned in our sense of them being advanced in either size or near enough fully grown. They are usually believed to be commonly born as live larvae or eggs that must be then nurtured further before they are able to hatch and are able to rapidly grow into their mature form. However, for the most basic bioforms, they will often emerge in a fully mature state so as to be able to immediately begin serving their function for the hive. The birthing of Tyranid forms though is an absolute production line. Clusters of eggs will be continuously spilling out from the rows of orifices along a Norn Queen's flanks. Nutrient fluid filled depressions on the massive alien mother's upper surface will writhe with maggot like larvae while all sizes and shapes of amniotic sacs for numerous other bioforms will hang all around the queen from corded umbilicals. One role of high importance for the Norn Queen though as I previously mentioned is that of the hive mind. The hive mind or the synaptic web is an ever present field of psychic energy used by the Tyranids to control all of their bioforms. While it is not accurate and true to say that the queen is the hive mind, the Norn Queens do exert more influence within it than other forms. Also, without the queen there could be no further production of Tyranids and the hive ship itself and so one might consider them to be something of a linchpin in the context of their more powerful sense of sentience over the lesser creatures. To help illustrate this, the queen has such a powerful presence that if a Norn queen were ever to be killed, the psychic backlash of their death in the hive mind is said to approach a Gamma 12 in intensity. Now this is two steps below the most powerful of Alpha, but in the scale of psychic power it is still within the highest range of psychic shockwaves. And so powerful is this that it will cause nearby Tyranid hive ships to spontaneously birth new Norn Queens. This is undoubtedly a survival mechanism of the Tyranid species referred to as the Hydra effect, and so for the non-Tyranid aggressors what can initially seem like a victory can actually splinter Tyranid fleets into new subdivisions that can eventually steadily grow to become even larger than the original. It should be made clear though that while some creatures like a Norn Queen do appear to have more influence over the Tyranid's hive mind and that they are very important for it, it should not be seen as having any sense of an overarching command. The Tyranids do not operate under any kind of strict hierarchical structure. They will have undoubtedly lesser forms and more powerful forms, even partially self-aware forms, but one and the other are not mutually exclusive. Tyranids can strangely be independent, yet also still part of the hive mind. In fact, some Tyranid forms are actively designed to be singular entities, whereas others are mere tools. So Tyranids can seemingly also create instances of a hive mind at a far more localised level, the so-called brood mind. 
and these are seen in instances where, say, a gene stealer cult may appear. And this also has the feature of drawing a hive fleet in the hive mind towards it over time. So a Norn Queen, whilst an important and undoubtedly critical linchpin for a hive mind within a ship and a fleet, does not constitute anything that we might imagine as being a general or a commander of Tyranid forces. This is only very, very roughly how we might interpret the way Tyranids function. For the hive mind itself is somewhat unfathomable to us. It is a psychic presence of untold billions of creatures. It is also a powerful tactical tool which enables Tyranids to coordinate, react and adapt as if every single Tyranid creature exists as part of a single massive organism, which effectively is exactly what they are. Synapse creatures are those bioforms who can act as a psychic conduit or if you imagine something akin to a nodal relay, by which the hive mind is then projected and can permeate the lesser members of hives and swarms. To this end, synapse creatures are therefore absolutely essential to the continuing effective functionality of a tyranid swarm and fleet because it is only through these synapses that the swarm's natural instincts can be overridden to obey the will of the hive mind, and without this they would degenerate quickly into more feral animalistic behaviour. Although, to be sure, for human observers of approaching tyranid swarms, it might be difficult to tell the difference. Synapse bioforms are usually not designated singularly with this role in mind, however. Few complex tyranid forms will occupy a singular role, and to this end the tyranids are more like a traditional hierarchical structure, in that the higher up the ladder you go, the more roles those positions tend to balance, although again, this is not exclusively true, and they don't really have any kind of hierarchical structure. Synapses tend to be leaders though, such as hive tyrants, warriors, dominatrix, turvigons, primes, or malceptors. There are also those more specialist creatures which are highly powerful psychers like zoanthropes or even the terrifyingly powerful neurothropes. The connecting feature between all of these creatures though is that they have greatly increased synapse networks within their cortex and thus act as psychic conduits for the hive mind. So this synaptic web is central to the efficiency and ability for tyranid forms to be collectively coordinated by their group sentience that is the hive mind. They form as a whole a synaptic web of psychic influence and feedback, and the synapse creatures are the psychic pylons which carry the threads of the synaptic web and allow all to connect with one another and share their stimuli to then best react, coordinate and command. They bring order to the chaos and filter the decisions by means of their vast collective brain power. The strangest curiosity when it comes to the synapse creatures is that they are all at some level potent individual psychers, even if they do not use these offensively. It remains a mystery how the Tyranids are able to do this though without causing both the attention of chaotic entities and just beings within the warp who would ordinarily be drawn like moths to these burning psychic flames. But then truly both of these things are beyond human comprehension at this time. Interestingly enough though, this likely says more about the entities within the warp than it does the Tyranids. Essentially, we know that to be possessed or used as a vessel or to be the means for a breach into reality by demons of the warp, to begin with, you have to have some emotional or sentient connection with the warp itself. For want of a more specific term, this basically means having a soul. How you might define that is another matter, but it appears to be that the more free will you have, the stronger this connection is going to be, the more instinct driven entities like your animalistic forms do not offer anything that makes them noteworthy or worthwhile for chaos to corrupt. It's tempting for us to want to think of the hive mind and its synaptic web as being similar to something like the Borg in Star Trek with a real sentient thought process going on. And while it bears some similarity to that, it's not the same at all, because Although there are those entities, like we said, the Hive Queens, which have more of a powerful influence within the Hive Mind, they are, as I noted earlier, not a hierarchical structure, they're not commanders, they are, if you will, simply more powerful nodes within the whole. There is intelligence, there is decision making, there is cunning and rationalisation, but it is not the same as a sentient, free-thinking individual.
and this in and of itself would likely be very difficult and confusing for chaos entities to begin to approach because they're very focused on individual free thinking sentient beings not some massive collective whole this is another reason as i go on a wider tangent here why orcs are also very unaffected by chaos individually when not having a warg orcs are simplistic basic animalistic even they may have some base desires but nothing that they can't solve themselves by bashing some heads not to mention obviously they have their own gods gork mork and so when orcs do get into a war frenzy they generate their own psychic fields that are channeled into themselves or their weird boys anyway the overall point being similarly to orcs who when they get into a frenzy they're really not one entity anymore they become a mass of psychic energy or thrashing and convulsing and trying to allow some order to rise out of the ocean of the thoughts and the voices and the tyranid's hive mind is somewhat similar it's billions of animalistic instincts and more sentient thoughts all thrown together and so it creates a truly immense psychic static which surrounds them all and this is the phenomena referred to as the shadow in the warp it would be the equivalent of turning on a radio with white noise and turning it to the maximum volume and then turning on a thousand other radios all around you until it was quite literally deafening you this is the psychic effect of the tyranid hive mind it's why psychers on a world approached by the tyranid fleets the hive mind will go completely insane unless they are either astonishingly powerful or absurdly weak astropaths cannot see through this vast wall of static to either send messages or to navigate their ships and ships cannot leave or enter systems covered by this shadow it's also very likely that for these same reasons it's why chaos and demons and entities within the warp are unable to have any effect upon tyranids because it is after all called the shadow in the warp it is this sphere this wall that they cannot penetrate and very often the tyranids are focused on as a gigantic alien killing machine who are sharp of tooth toxic of blood and it's true they are terrifying and they are vast they are the great devourer the destroyer however while this is one of their greatest strengths perhaps when all is said and done their most terrifying and powerful strength is in fact the synaptic web it's their static psychic shield nearly all other races face some danger from the warp yet the tyranids dodge this threat very easily and at several levels at an individual level they're too dull of mind and animalistic as a collective their focus is purely on the instinctive drive to consume and nothing else perhaps though most importantly of all the tyranid beast is cold it is cold it is unfeeling and as is illustrated with the level of disregard they have for their own kin they are one living organism they do not feel as we do they do not have emotions of pride or anger envy remorse or mercy they only exist to exist and consume so next we will learn more about tyranid spores and there is a surprising amount to study when it comes to tyranid spores it may not sound that interesting but they are actually very important although it can be fairly summed up by just stating they're numerous and they generally explode with horrible consequences but tyrannids will deploy a variety of different spores upon planets and this is usually one of the first signs of an oncoming tyranid invasion the most commonly known is what's referred to as a mycetic spore these can appear as if they were a meteor shower penetrating a planet's atmosphere crashing into say an ocean seemingly causing little if any negative effect the danger appears to pass but then later you begin to see vanguard forms like the lictor or gene stealers appear and this is when a world will begin to realize the meteor like spore shower was just an initial seeding for what will now be a coming assault upon a world so these mycetic spores are in essence like a living drop pod yet they're also able to detect nearby threats and will lash out at anything nearby they appear something like a hermit crab and they may choose to make it to land or remain in a planet's ocean where they will soon die after impact but their role is fulfilled as their cargo will burst forth from within them unleashing a brood of tyranid forms which could be scout units designed to stealth and gather what counts for intelligence from a tyranny perspective or they may be used en masse to deliver smaller forms such as rippers hormigaunts but even up to something like a carnifex a much larger creature 
More recent strains of mycetic spores have been seen to evolve sensory nodes that are shielded with ablative chitin that burns off during the orbital insertion to allow the spore to make a more accurate landing by honing in on pheromone trails released by the lictors. And when a spore of this type makes impact with the planet's surface, its outer shell will die away, peeling apart to reveal another organism inside that will then take the sustenance from the outer shell to fuel a powerful bioweapon. So these large assaulting drop pod like spores are not the only way in which tyranids can affect a planet from orbit. They can also release a cloud of microscopic spores which will blanket or drift down into a world's biosphere and begin to affect it without its inhabitants even becoming initially aware. They can also deploy this process more directly by what are referred to as sporocysts and these appear as bloated fleshy pods released by bioships in low orbit and they will float through a prey world's atmosphere until reaching the surface whereupon they will burrow into the earth leaving only their venting spore chimneys atop. These sporocysts will then begin to pump billions of polluting microorganisms who begin a process of violently altering the planet's atmosphere and ecology. The role of these microscopic spores tend to be either to accelerate plant growth, thus aiding the reclamation or also digestion of a planet's biomass when the tyranid assault eventually reaches this stage. They may also use these spores to poison life on a world which could at pure face value appear to be counterproductive, except you must remember that a tyranid assault's core goal is to always achieve a net positive in terms of biomass. So if they can weaken a world by poisoning some of its life, this may in turn weaken a world's resistance when the actual physical assault occurs, meaning that they will expend then less biomass, taking less casualties, so the initial poisoning effect can in turn be beneficial in the bigger picture of an entire planetary assault. If sporocysts detect a potential threat nearby, they can deploy spore mines or larger deadlier mucolid spores. And there are theories that sporocysts act as psychic resonators as well, boosting the abilities of synapse creatures nearby so that they may better carry out the hive mind's commands. And even if this is merely a coincidental observation, Imperial biologists feel sure that when sporocysts are scattered across a planet's surface, they very likely form a series of synaptic staging posts to enable the higher tyranid leader forms to better direct deployment and flow of any invasion. Another spore type is the meiotic spore, and these are more like aerial mines and appear like large sacks filled with extremely corrosive bioacid and other toxins. They also contain smaller spore mines within them. They're noted by the Imperium as appearing to perform an anti-air defense role and will detonate when they sense an enemy nearby, whereupon they will then shower their foe with razor-sharp chitin, cutting through metal and flesh with ease. The Tyranids have been known to use another air-based spore known as a mucolid spore, reportedly this is more explosive in nature. Lastly, there are the more commonly seen ground level spore mines, and these are usually launched from a form known as a biovore, although they can also be deployed like other spores from orbit. Their title is very generic because they seem to appear within a variety of different purposes, from spores which explode with needle-like chitin laced with poisons to pierce flesh and infect enemy, to clouds of toxin gas, and these various poisons can have a ranging and horrific effect on infantry from extreme nerve damage like a neurotoxin to literally eating a living human alive from the inside out to nearby onlookers this would appear as if they were literally falling to pieces as if suffering severe radiation damage but in a mere matter of seconds rather than weeks as well as various other and certainly unknown effects from fast clotting of blood to extreme internal hemorrhaging when it comes to tyrannies the horrifying effects are seemingly with few limitations. Spore mines can also appear as fragmentation bioforms, much like human grenades and anti-personnel mines, but entirely organic. They will explode with a pressurized concussive blast and shower nearby infantry with, again, razor-sharp shell shards designed to lacerate enemy and cause extreme injury to slow down and cripple enemy forces, or, of course, to kill. But like most mines, the goal tends to be to slow down the enemy as they become overwhelmed with those needing urgent medical attention. Lastly, one of the most common features of tyranid forms and perhaps one of the most feared for human forces, spores can be filled with, again, tyranid bioacid. And when spore mines are detonated near infantry, this will shower over them. The consequences are obviously usually quite horrific, dependent on just how much is showered 
and how nearby and well shielded the humans in the field of this blast are. Very little has been known to stop these tyranid bioacids and it's even said to be able to easily burn through ceramite plate used by space marines on their armour, so try not to get it on your skin. Spore mines often once deployed will drift for days, weeks or even years until an unwary foe comes near to it. Like many Tyranid forms, they do possess something of a very, very basic instinctive intelligence and are covered in sensitive feelers which seek out heat and movement. It's often been observed as well how spore mines in a cluster are seemingly linked and so when one explodes, a chain reaction will occur. The reasons as to why the Tyranids have determined this to be the best means of their operation is unknown, but for human fighters it can actually make clearing out these mines far easier than having to deal with them singularly. Lastly, within the initial assault sphere of spore weaponry for Tyranids are what are known as Tyrannocytes. Now while technically a spore, these are again another bioform of the Tyranid with some sense of sentience, although again extremely basic. They also really are the Tyranid equivalent of a drop pod and will be launched down to a world with other forms within them. The impact of its landing causes its gravid belly to split, disgorging its other bioforms inside. And once it's delivered its payload, the Tyrannocyte will very often begin then to fill itself with gas to enable it to once again float around. Whereupon it will begin to then rain death upon the enemy with death spitters, barbed stranglers and so on. Incidentally, a death spitter is a fairly standard Tyranid ranged weapon and is also typically unpleasant. As with most Tyranid forms, it's a symbiotic weapon which launches corrosive maggot creatures through muscular spasms. Wherever the maggots strike, the highly acidic fluids will splash over and dissolve through near enough anything it comes into contact with. And they've also been known to take various other forms whereby the launched maggots will use this acidic layer to burrow through an inside of their victim, taking on mass and eventually bursting out through from the inside, essentially eating them alive from the inside out. So try to avoid this on the battlefield where possible. But death spitters, devourers, flesh borers, all of these are kind of tyranid weapons, variations on a theme. They tend to be insects covered in acid which bore through you and tear you apart. It seems sensible next to move on to rippers as they're a fairly basic tyranid bioform and really are quite self-explanatory. Their primary focus is in devouring and shredding biomass on a world and this does not necessarily mean they're going to be used in a battle. In fact, very often rippers are deployed at a later stage in a Tyranid invasion, but often of course they may well be deployed just as a battle force equally. Overall though, their role is actually in shredding a world to prepare it for consumption by the hive ships. Rippers then are mindless creatures, their role is entirely as a service creature. Without the Tyranid synapse, they would become non-functioning and likely cannibalistic devouring and slaughtering anything they encounter. When functioning correctly, of course, they can in fact be a terrifying foe if encountered in significant numbers, as they will descend upon any and all biological life like a literal wave that will tear any and all to pieces in mere seconds. Small aside, there is a secondary form of ripper known as an eel ripper, which tends to be seen in a planet's oceans and liquid bodies. To be clear though, rippers do not merely just shred biological matter. They actively consume it themselves, and then later, once they are fully bloated and unfit for any kind of combat or consummation, they will steadily crawl toward what are called reclamation pools, whereupon, instead of vomiting their consumed mass into the pool, they simply hurl themselves into the pool itself, where they will then be consumed, their mass will be broken down, they're essentially dissolved and absorbed back by the hive fleet. This disturbing process is fairly typical of Tyranid forms, whereby they will readily kill themselves as the hive mind is functioning on a larger scale, knowing that these mindless drones will then simply be reprocessed into new forms, minimizing biomass wastage. Rippers, although as noted, require the synapse to function correctly, have been known if abandoned by a hive fleet before a world is fully consumed for whatever reason, are seen to burrow underground before somehow metamorphosing into a higher bioform. 
This has led some within the biologists to make highly speculative conclusions that rippers are something of a pluripotent form. This is the theory that they could change into any kind of tyranid creature with the right signals from the hive mind, kind of similarly to a stem cell. This means they could become hive tyrants, they could become gene stealers, lictors, anything. Alternatively, it could be just another emergency trigger built into these lesser forms to ensure that they maximize their worth. Ordinarily, their role is simplistic, to be consumed back into the gross mass of the hive fleet. But if that's not possible and they're abandoned, their value will change into the continuing resistance and assault against whatever enemy remains on a planet. So these lesser forms are better to use what biomass and energy they contain by changing themselves into a form which can continue to weaken a world with the goal, presumably, of making it easier for the fleet to continue its assault when and if it returns, although of course this remains entirely speculative. I will add on here as well within the sphere of rippers is a form known as a cortex leech. It's not technically a ripper, but it is ripper-like. It's smaller, but in some ways more disturbing. They will attach themselves onto the face of their victim and then insert long feelers into the brain cavity of their victims via the eyes, nose and ears. Disturbing them though, not through the mouth, meaning anyone observing nearby would have to endure the stomach turning scream of the victims, that is until of course these feelers penetrate and begin manipulating their host's brain, then forcing them to become a drooling drone like puppet under the synapse control of the hive mind, essentially they become tyrannid zombies. Some genus of Tyranid are incredibly broad and many forms that fall within a general genetic sphere, with only very small differences between them to distinguish enable them to fulfil specialised roles, not unlike how say a regular army may have assault units, heavy weapon teams and so on. And this is the role taken by what are known as Gaunts. They're often fairly small in comparative size to other Tyranids and they take on a role of essentially the highly adaptable frontline unit who appear in very large numbers, wielding again a highly flexible range of weapons. Some of the most well-known Gaunt types are Hormagaunts, Spine Gaunt, Termagant, Hypergaunt, Night Gaunt, Death Gaunt, there are very many. There are also those less well studied like the Hellgaunts, Terragaunts, Slashgaunts, Razorgaunts, Crucigaunts, Exagaunts, Malgaunts, Mortagaunts, Rendergaunts, Protagaunts, Paragaunts, Lashgaunts, Ginagaunts, Toxagaunts. My what a lot of gaunts there are. I'll also note that there is a flying tyranid form known as a gargoyle that can be considered within the gaunt genus as it appears much like a flying termagant. However, others within the family of gargoyles such as the harpy do not align with this gaunt gaunt form, so whilst you could include them I think generally they're better to sit within their own sphere. Basically though gaunts are immense and numerous, and fulfil a role of being highly flexible and greatly disposable. They are the archetypal tyranid assault unit. Some of those lesser known are likely due to the fact that tyranids are able to tailor their forces like we said to specific engagements, so some forms may be documented via imperial data cores which are then sent deep into a planet for later recovery, essentially a kind of planetary black box and when these are studied by the inquisition or the biologist they may reference specific gaunt types which are documented but then will never be seen again. It may be that the hive was experimenting with a new form and then decided to scrap this for whatever reason. In terms of the more common basic gaunt types though the most well known is of course the termagant. Termagants are fast, agile and cunning little creatures. They often barely span more than two meters head to tail and are believed by the biologist to have originally been servicing in the defense of the hive ships and so their size was designed to occupy the arterial passages of the bio ships in search of intruders. But now they will take a core role in planetary invasions and termagants will usually accompany larger tyranid warriors. It will commonly wield what are known as the fairly self-explanatory weapon titled as Flesh Borers. Termagants appear to have a very close relationship with the Tyranid warrior class and will react instantly to any enemy that threatens their larger kin, drowning the foe in overwhelming numbers. The specific reason for this though are unknown, but given the Tyranid warriors are a known synapse creature, it's logical that they should be programmed to behave in this manner as a reflexive instinct. Although often seen in vast numbers, underestimating the very humble Termagant is a grave error. They're more cunning than they may appear and will often seek to circumvent 
circumvented direct assault so that the last thing you will see will be a wave of thousands of termagants descending onto your position seemingly out of nowhere and by then it's too late. At the same time, like all Tyranid forms, they are very expendable when necessary, and their sheer weight of numbers means they will often be used as fodder, thrust directly at enemy positions to draw fire away from the more complex and powerful enemies approaching behind the front line or positioning themselves on enemy flanks. So Tamagants are a very simple Tyranid form, but play a highly flexible and critical role in their invasions. And then as noted, the Hormigaunts are another extremely common archetypal form of Tyranid, they're incredibly single-minded, and the Hormigaunts' near soul focus is on two things, moving extremely fast and slaughtering its enemy by eviscerating them with scythe like talon and claws. They will move generally in massive swarms using their dense numbers to seemingly take continual fire from defenders whilst barely appearing to take any noticeable losses at all. Hormigaunts have been long studied by the biologists and they're believed to be a specialised iteration of the termagant bioform. However, unlike the termagant, they tend to be most commonly using only physical razor sharp claws and scythes, not ranged symbiotic weaponry. A Hormigaunt will not only kill its prey though, but they will also then immediately feed upon them after killing. Its metabolism enables it to continually power toward enemies with lightning speed, and this process of kill, gorge, assault drives it to constantly seek out and feast upon fresh prey. They're often used as a frontline unit not only because of their aggression, speed, and numbers, but because their natural instincts are usually enough for them to carry out a successful assault. They actually require very little input from the hive mind and so they don't require proximity with larger synapse forms like the warriors or the tyrants. Gaunts in general are most often deployed in Tyranno sites and the reason being that it's highly likely that in the early stages of a planetary assault many of these pods will be destroyed by orbital defences before they're able to make planetfall. Thus it is very logical for these drop pods to be filled with very highly expendable gaunt bioforms. The more complex and less expendable medium sized forms will follow later when a planet has become more preoccupied with the situation on the ground. Also, whilst being expendable, the gaunt should again not be underestimated. In fact, this carpet bombing approach in the early stages of a Tyranid assault is perfectly within their biomass efficiency calculations because even if a minimal number of the pods are able to reach the surface, then the gaunts which thrust forth will very quickly escalate into a serious problem for a world's defenders. And the primary reason being that unlike many other Tyranid forms, gaunts are actually able to reproduce asexually independently themselves. And they will lay hundreds of eggs in the early stage of their life cycle just below a planet's surface so that although their lifespan is short and hyper aggressive, a new swarm will already be hatching and laying and growing and assaulting, and the cycle will only continue exponentially, meaning that unless they are eradicated almost on landing, the situation will very quickly become a highly demoralizing downward spiral for the defenders of a world who will only seemingly have to engage with more and more gaunts with each wave that assaults their citadels. Once a Tyranid hive ship begins to deploy its medium synapse creatures and heavy rearline artillery units, along with potentially the truly terrifying titanic bio machines. An Imperial or indeed any world will be by now usually bunkered into their cities and heavily on the defensive whilst oceans of gaunts lash the planet's surface, hunting for anything of a sentient living state. And gaunts will collectively use a variety of weapons ranged and melee, and these have been defined as primarily six types. The Flesh Borer, Devourer, Scythe Talons, spine fists, strangle webs, and spike rifles. While all fairly self-explanatory, there are interesting details within each weapon. Firstly, the very well-known flesh borer is a ranged weapon and is essentially a portable brood nest for sharp fanged borer beetles. These beetles are kept in their mature state in a hormone-induced dormancy until the weapon is ready to be fired. Like all the Tyranid weapons, they form a symbiotic connection at a neural level with the wielder, meaning that neural impulses from the wielder will, in this weapon's situation, force one of the insects into a firing sphincter. From here, the beetle can be fired at a target by a further impulse, and when fired, a frenzied borer beetle will hurtle itself forward with a powerful kick of its flea-like legs not launched by pressure, it actually launches itself. The beetle then spends all of its remaining life energy boring through the armour, the flesh and the bone of their enemy. 
The beetle itself is by design blind, having been specifically bioengineered to lessen any possible deviation in its flight path. They also will secrete a potent digestive enzyme upon impact with the target, aiding the penetration of armor and flesh. Not that it would necessarily need to be understood in a true sense, but quite obviously these weapons also have the impact of evoking terror and horror within the enemies of the Tyranid. By the nature of its biological ammunition, a flesh borer can easily be adapted by the Hive Fleet to counter specific defences. One example would be the bizarre Screamer Beetle, designed purely to sow terror and confusion amongst the enemy ranks, unleashing an ear-splitting shriek as it's propelled through the air at high speed. Massed salvos of Screamer Beetles give rise to a nightmarish cacophony that is enough to shred the nerves of all but the most grizzled veteran warriors, and other forms might explode on impact with powerful acids or even ignite, dousing their victims in biofuel before somehow self-igniting them. Then comes the Devourer. And this is another weapon which does exactly what it says on the tin. If the flesh borer was unpleasant, then the devourer is its doubled down iteration. Its appearance is that of a conical lump of partly rotted flesh escaping from a chitin moor. Infested by writhing flesh worms with shiny black heads, when the weapon is triggered, a bioelectrical jolt hurls a shower of these creatures at the enemy with immense force. They will either shatter on impact, spraying their foe with acid, or more often pierce their victim victim, where they will then immediately start burrowing into the flesh, eating their way through the victim's neurological tissues and move to the spinal column on into the brain. To no surprise, instantaneous panic followed by madness will follow as a result of the unbearable and unescapable agony caused by this process. So severe that usually suicide by their own weapon is not even possible, only the mercy of their comrades would be all that one could hope for. Were it not for the speed of death, this process is surely enough to drive the victim almost entirely insane. Once the bugs reach the victim's brain, they will then proceed to, you guessed it, devour it. Now when we come to the strangle web, it should be noted that this was a weapon seen in the past to be wielded by the lower tuned forms such as the termagant, but these have been seen less and less. Usually the only iteration of this, known as the barbed strangler, is now seen on larger bioforms like the carnifex or tyrannocytes. The strangle web though was a small and bizarre looking creation formed a composite of a creature between something of a weapon and spider. It would fire masses of sticky strands which would wrap themselves around their victim, primarily to immobilize them, not kill them, and the more that they would struggle though, the tighter this bioweb would become, and this could continue even up to a point where it would eventually literally strangle them to death. It's believed though that the focus for these weapons was less on lethality and more for capturing live victims for return to the hive ships. Then we come to the last of the gaunt projectiles, and these were again used primarily by termagants and are known as the spike rifles, which are not unlike many tyranid weapons, almost comically overpowered, and this is very much by design. They not only fire what are essentially are razor sharp harpoons, but these are also covered with razor sharp barbs to then shred whatever they penetrate, usually causing huge bleeding of the victims. This though is another weapon seen less commonly now by the gaunt form, who seem to more often favour either the flesh borer or the devourer. Lastly, we have the slightly misleading spine fist, which sounds as if it would yet again be quite self-explanatory, except that a spine fist is not as it sounds, it's not a melee weapon for merely punching into an enemy. Those would be more like the rending and crushing claws seen in other tyranid forms. No, the spine fist is in fact a projectile weapon, albeit one designed for more close range engagements. Its name is given because of its appearance, where it is seen to wrap around its user's wrist. But like most Tyranid weapons, it is a symbiotic form and is seen to be mostly typically carried in pairs. They will connect to the airways of its host by a long tube-like tail that burrows through the host's limb into their torso, and a spine fist carapace is arranged into rows of diamond-hard spines, and these are lethally coated with neurotoxins. Another common feature of Tyranid weapons which will assault the nervous system of the victim and are fired by a sharp exhalation of the host. Thus, a larger and more powerful host can exhale more spines in each salvo, ripping through the flesh of any caught victims. 
And then we come to what are known as Tyranid Scythe Talons, which are to no surprise, again, relatively straightforward. These are less seen than Termagant and more by the other Gaunts, most commonly of course the Hormagaunt, and these along with their teeth and sharpened chitin bodies are their only real weapons. But Scythe Talons are generally a very common Tyranid weapon overall, and it's no surprise because most Tyranids will have at least some form of sharpened, extremely toughened chitin melee weapon, which they will use to terrifying efficiency in close quarters. Quarters, and they'll be backed by dense muscles which power them into their enemy and are very capable of piercing or carving through the heaviest armour wielded by the Imperium including Ceramite of the Astartes. So I thought it would be fun to return with and finish this episode with an ancient piece of Tyranid lore, something not heavily documented in the modern times of the Imperial Biologist's reading. And we'll finish back around with this piece of knowledge related again to the Norn Queens of Tyranid High Fleets. The Tyranids have come to devour all biomatter they encounter, this we know, but they also seek genetic material to feed their Norn Queens and continue to develop and strengthen their high fleets. So it's not heavily documented, but early studies by the biologists are suggestive that the Tyranids do not simply shred all planetary biomatter and those who live upon a world, but will instead often take living captives and bring them back upon their hive ships. It is presumed that they will then directly feed these to the Norn Queen who will ingest the still living victims before genetically breaking them apart and absorbing their DNA to feed into the pool of genetic knowledge used by the hive fleet as well as sharing this information with other Norn Queens. However, it is also believed that not all captives are fed to the Norn Queen. Some a sacrifice to breeding programs and it will be their grisly unfortunate fate to become hosts for immature grubs or the larvae of bioconstructs. Some victims are not immediately needed for consumption and so they will preserve these forms for later use via shroud spinners who will weave an anaesthetizing cocoon to envelop the victim keeping them alive until later needed. Now you may think how could the biologist possibly have gained such knowledge? Well to be sure some of it is speculative but generally this has been observed when Imperial troops of unbelievable strength and bravery, including of course Space Marines, have somehow managed to assault a Tyranid ship and still lived to tell of it. And in doing so, they sometimes encountered whole chambers of cocooned human victims. Which then brings us to one specific creature that is said to feed upon a captive during its larval stage, known as the Parasitic Mind Slaver. Now, Tyranids are well known for controlling other bioforms, as we discussed earlier with the Cortex leeches. And this kind of behaviour can also be seen when gene stealer cults spring up. And again, this is a form of Tyranid mind control. But aboard Tyranid ships, they will utilize a creature known as a mind slaver. Now this in some respects is somewhat of a misnomer because this bioform is actually used to enable Tyranids to gain temporary control over other critical biomachines which have malfunctioned or become damaged. So they're really kind of repair organisms. But the mind slaver takes over the individual mind of the biomachine if it has some sentience to it to prevent it from causing further damage to either itself or other systems. Systems. This will then allow the hive mind to control its functions until it's able to resume its standard role. And again, one might question, well, why don't they simply just replace it? Or well, presumably within a hive ship, some of their biomechanical systems are either too complex, too critical, or just difficult to produce, perhaps dangerous to replace whilst the living hive ship. The reasons are not especially clear, but any number of speculations could adequately explain why the Tyranids choose this process. And presumably there are many instances where they're able to make straight replacements, but it's important as always to keep in mind that the Tyranids primary function above all things is to minimize biomass wastage and to ensure things are achieved as efficiently as possible and it may simply be that it is more efficient to repair something than it is to replace it. But the designation of mind slaver comes from again humans who somehow were able to bear witness to the inner workings of a hive ship whereby they observed some humans carrying out tasks around a hive ship. Seemingly as part of the hive itself. They moved around unmolested and were extremely hostile to those attempting to save them. The biologists have discovered that the parasitic larval form of the creature is about the size of a pea or small pebble and that when the egg laid by the Norn Queen is introduced into a living captive it will then burrow into its victim's skull and attach itself to the base of the medulla. At first 
the immature creature is not powerful enough to influence its host. But as it becomes stronger, the hive mind will begin to seep into the host's brain and eventually take over and direct all of the creature's higher brain functions. And these victims are designated as mind slaves. Their actions and thoughts are completely controlled by the Tyranid hive mind, and it's entirely unknown the level of conscious awareness these victims will then have of what is happening to them, and one would hope that this is minimal if any. Although, given the standard fare of 40k creatures and consequences, this seems perhaps unlikely. So for fun, let's just say that they're fully aware and they feel everything. And then, Eventually, the mind slaver will outgrow and need to destroy its host by bursting out through the head like an exploding melon. But until it does so, the mind slave will, as was noted, move about the ship and perform tasks under the direction of the hive mind. If the ship is attacked, the mind slaves will be among the first to move to its defense, being the most expendable, especially if they belong to an armed warrior race whose fighting skills may be usefully employed by the Tyranids. It's been noted that the Tyranids seem not especially fussy about which sentient forms they use in these roles, as the Eldar Orcs, even Chaos Marines, have been observed wandering the cavities of Tyranid ships. The ultimate fate of a mind slave, as noted, is to simply become a segment in the life cycle of the mind slaver. Once they begin to mature, they appear more like a large crab who will then wander through the small functional pipes of a hive ship, attaching itself when required to a system which needs to be constrained. When the parasitic form has eventually reached its stage of near maturity, its host head will now appear extremely distended, with flesh tearing apart ripped like fabric. But before completely leaving the host, the mind slaver excretes a chemical designed to insist the host, which will then form a sheath around them, while inside the body will then quickly be dissolved, liquefied essentially, and the mind slaver in its final parasitic stage will feed off of this soup before it completes its life cycle as a mature tyranid bioform. So as we come to the end today, I will aim to return relatively soon with the next instalment of this series. Likely this will encompass us looking at more medium scale forms of the Tyranid, as well as perhaps the infrastructure bioforms. Then we can move on to the larger creatures, lastly we can look in on the Titanic scale and fleet ships. After this, I would imagine delving in onto something like gene stealers. This is a good place to begin with specific studies, although maybe this can come in the next one before we continue with the overview. But as always, remember by the time you see the skies turning dark as the Tyranid Hive ship blocks out the sun, you begin to see showers of spores flying down through the atmosphere, the chances are that no one's there to save you. And very likely an emergency call that was sent out will never have reached anyone, as they will have been blocked by the psychic shadow cast by the Tyranids, which inhibit any warp message and travel for escape. Beware the great devourer. For as one chaplain of the Astartes was once heard to say, we must scour them from the stars before they do the same to us. Since 745 and 41, the threat of Tyranid Hive fleets has been continually growing. Losses in fighting have been extreme, 
and the demand for manpower has strained even Departmento Munitorum's vast resources. Projections indicate that such heavy losses are unsustainable in the long term. Whilst the Turnits may be halted, the indirect effect for Imperium's rule in other segmentums could be disastrous. More efficient ways of meeting and defeating the Turnits must be sought, and Felium Base may be part of this process. A series of covert biologist research facilities were established. See Oxenos Order 5657-XX823, classified Absolutum Ultra, to study Turnic genetic material and the racy super-evolutionary traits in controlled environment. Ways of interfering in the Turnit's ability to rapidly evolve, adapt and overcome new threats have been sought with the experiment eventually leading to new anti-Tyranid biological weapons technology. A large part of the moon's surface is used as a research facility. There are three principal laboratory facilities and a central control complex. A network of force field generators encloses large areas of the moon's surface. These are containment areas for the experiments. There are three principal containment areas, coded areas Alpha, Beta and Omega, as well as other smaller subsidiary isolation areas. The containment field network is controlled from its own central control complex and powered by a series of power field generator stations. I now see the potential peril that my forces and I are in, as I now suspect the Turnits are indeed here on this moon. I have conducted an emergency briefing. With the information now at my disposal, my first priorities are 1. To reactivate the containment fence, as these represent our most effective defense. They should keep the enemy at bay long enough for me to complete the mission objectives of recovering data. 2. Begin operations to search the laboratory facilities with all haste. Commander Kahn has already begun the transfer of his forces from the command complex to laboratory area Delta. The plan of action is as follows. Further investigations have revealed that the generators for each of the force field fences have been deactivated. This event is inexplicable to me, as there is no damage, but it must have led to the loss of the entire facility. All four of the generatorums will need reactivating as they provide the power required to maintain the impenetrable force field barriers. It will be the Elysian's first task. I have issued orders for them to take and hold the generators long enough for the servitors to restart the system. Meanwhile, Red Scorpions will begin the process of investigating the laboratory sites. As yet, all three bases remain a mystery. Space Marines will sweep each site systematically in a search and destroy operation. Once secured, Imperial Guard troops will move in behind and form a new protective garrison, whilst the Space Marines move on to the next site. With the Cadians in position, Magus Biologist Arthens Explorators teams can now move in and begin the process of collating any useful data and samples. Colm and his first company veterans will again lead the way, with his tactical squads arriving via Thunderhawk as a second wave of reinforcements. Whilst the search and destroy operation is underway, a company of Cadians will move overland to the first laboratory site in an armored convoy of Chimeras. Only once the Cadians are in position will the Magus Biologists follow. In all, I expect each operation to take no longer than 8 hours. An entire operation will therefore take 24 hours. I continue to plan for two-day deployment on this perilous moon. Time enough to search all the laboratory facilities, recover any surviving experimental data and embark back onto the Cephastus. After two days, I will gladly abandon this planet and file a request for exterminators.